Are we going mummy or mommy on this one? Should we Americanize? Mommy. It's got to be mommy, It's right? clearly American, yeah. Mummy, dearest. So it has a different kind of vibe to it. <laughs> mm. Oh, yeah. mummy, please. Mummy. Just sounds a bit Tory politician. <laughs> On the phone to his mother. Well, have you heard? Apparently, what is it that all, the Tory cabinet all called Theresa May mummy or something like oh, that? Oh, God, no. I know. Oh. Isn't that... Oh, oh that's vile. <laughs> that was genuinely upsetting. Yeah, that's I, the most I, I was dist- much richer for not knowing that. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn also insists on mummy. Yeah, <laughs> They all call him that. I'm sorry, I've loaded up a newspaper article with GQ now, uh, the title of which, Why Do Tories Keep Calling Theresa May Mummy? And scrolling down, halfway down the page, is a fucking a link to an article, How to Get Into BDSM. <laughs> oh, oh, that's a wormhole I just don't want to follow. <laughs> what is the entryway to that? Just shutting your partner's foot in the door every now and then. <laughs> you call Theresa May Mummy and then realise that you're a masochist. Yeah, <laughs> Theresa May is the entry point to a BDSM relationship. Is oh, it's just too yeah. Much. Next step is ball cuffs. <laughs> <laughs> Strong and stable restraints. <laughs> I'm an embarrassment to my mother. <laughs> and today we are joined by... Oh, sorry, I didn't change this from when we were going to have more than one sorry. of you. Today we have part of the team behind the hit podcast, Beyond the Box Set. Uh, gent, please introduce yourself and your podcast. Hello, uh, so I'm John Lucas, the co-host of the hit podcast, thank you very much, Beyond the Box Set. We are a podcast that takes classic standalone movies and every week we attempt to pitch a prequel, a sequel or a spin-off to one of those movies, often with ludicrous results yes absolutely it's a really great podcast we've attempted to add to it a couple of times and we're on it yeah we're yes, on you've it been yes so you check that out yeah this is a re- return the favor slash revenge episode i guess because uh, <laughs> yeah i <laughs> yeah you guys came on for our christmas was it was it a christmas season or did you just pick a christmas film it was our christmas season wasn't it it was yes and we did, uh, yeah it was Christ- christmas ago. season yes yeah. we did christmas jingle all the way which was um <laughs> A crass treat, I would say. <laughs> and you thought to yourself, you think that's shit parenting? Watch this. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. The bar is raised, gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, today you've decided to bring out the same rotten undercooked meal again and again until the pools eat it. It's Mummy Dearest. We're ready for you, Miss Crawford. To a truly great lady, Miss Joan Crawford. You know what's missing in my life? Come on, you've got everything you want. No, I don't. I want a baby. Out of the question. Don't you dare judge me. We have a moral and legal responsibility. And what you're really doing is denying one of your children the opportunity to live a wonderful and advantaged life. It's Frank Perry's, oh, who are we kidding, Faye Dunaway's 1981 <laughs> film adaptation of Christina Crawford's expose of her ill treatment at the hands of her adopted mother, Hollywood mm. legend Joan Crawford. The film was received by critics uh, like the same rotten undercut. Oh, wait. <laughs> but I didn't like it anyway. Let's introduce another Paul into this situation. Paul Taylor at Time Out said, really, no dafter perhaps in some of Joni's own Warner Brothers melodramas. The trouble is, it thinks it's art. <laughs> That's his problem. <laughs> He went ahead and thought it was an art. <laughs> oh, I once thought I was an art for a whole summer. Got nothing done. <laughs> Roger Ebert at the Chicago Sun-Times says the material is presented essentially as sensationalism. The movie makes no attempt to draw psychological insights from the life of its Joan Crawford. You've got to get something out of your drunk Joan Crawford. <laughs> Crawford. My problem was this movie just didn't go far enough, really. Right? <laughs> just really yeah. soft pedaled the whole situation. It's very nuanced, I found. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was. Shades of Grey. Very sensitive portrayal of uh, mental illness, definitely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and abuse. Yes. Just the right amount of laughs. Yeah. Child abuse. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I was going to say something like, you see, this film just didn't know how to, you know, fell short on the laughs, but then I couldn't think of a legitimate film about child abuse. Jingle all the way. <laughs> <laughs> just mentioned it, guys. <laughs> that definitely fell short on the jokes. But not on the child abuse. <laughs> no, that was perfect. In many ways, if you combined these two movies, you'd have the perfect child abuse comedy. God, imagine having Arnold it's Schwarzenegger just... as your dad and Joan Crawford as your mum. Oh my or God. Or you're saying if Joan Crawford could suddenly jump into a jetpack or a sort of spacesuit. <laughs> 
and and win Christmas for for a Christina. <laughs> Everything will be okay. Sinbad. <laughs> it's bad. It's turbo doing? time. <laughs> <laughs> Christina, it's turbo time. <laughs> bring me the axe. Christina, bring me the jetpack. Public, on the other hand, fucking loved it because it's nuts. Nuts, nuts, nuts. We haven't mentioned that yet. It's nuts. Why did you tell her I got expelled? Because you did get expelled. That is a lie. <laughs> you love to torture. You love to make me hit you. It's batshit bonkers and people loved it. Sir Nighthawk. Excuse me, I must treat him with respect. Sir Nighthawk. <laughs> it's a controversial Got decision. A sir here. But I'm glad the Queen went with it. <laughs> it was a dark Christmas. <laughs> The queen was desperate. <laughs> desperate for knights. This is more like the life story of Joan Crawford. She is trying her best in the movie game, but things get on top of her. She adopts some children, but it turns to drink. And child abuse makes the kids do everything. Once seen, you won't forget the scenes. So at 15, 124 minutes, this film makes you think. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly does that. <laughs> yeah, I was I was going to make a similar joke, but I don't know if I had a cogent thought in the whole thing, except, ow, my head. <laughs> Just... I was numbed and then sad. It makes you not think, like Bleach. <laughs> me, me and one of my best friends, Sebastian, and whenever we get together, we have a game that we play when we watch films, which we call it the 10% game, where we uh-huh. will watch, we'll figure out from the length, winning length of the movie we're watching what 10% of the movie is exactly, and at every 10% interval, we will pause the movie and kind of discuss our thoughts on what's happened since the last 10%. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a fun way to watch really silly movies. With this one, every 10%, every, right about every 12 minutes, I think, because it's a two-hour movie, Every time we paused, we just kind of looked at each other and kind of, I don't know, I've got nothing. Just kind of Still shrugged. nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still no idea, mate. I mean, <laughs> you see what happened, right? I'm not entirely sure this qualifies as a movie. It's more like <laughs> a collection of vaguely connected scenes. Yeah, it's a sketch show. Of, uh, it's a Frankie Boyle written sketch show. Public have, um, have a few more things to say. Messlin over on YouTube. Mm. Yeah. Had to go out, outside of the box on this one. She says... Faye Dunaway was ridiculed because she showed the reality of a bipolar, narcissistic, abusive, and alcoholic Hollywood star. Faye played the truth. She likes to be called Faye. And people couldn't handle it. And why? Because her performance exposed who these movie stars really are. Yeah, that's why. (laughs) Jessica Lange played Joan inoffensively because she wanted to restore the fake pre-mommy dearest illusion about Joan, which represents the inherent dishonesty in Hollywood. Pre-mommy dearest. (laughs) I mean, we should play the 10% game with that review, I think. (laughs) Justice for Joan. (laughs) Justice for Joan! She was a saint. She killed my mum. She did it very, very (laughs) humanely. Um, Mommy Dearest was a great big hit at the second ever Rotten Tomatoes award ceremony. It picked up awards great. for Worst Screenplay, Worst Supporting Actress for um, Diana Scarwid, or Adult Christine, uh, Worst Supporting Actor for Steve Forrest, that fucking weird orange man from the first hour or so of the movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ro- the Roger Moore slash... Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> David Hasselhoff. It's Roger that was Moore it. and David yeah. Hasselhoff just mm. pushed into one confused man. <laughs> Uh, the film won Worst Picture, but more significantly, Faye Dunaway shared Worst Actress with Bo Derek for Tarzan, the Ape Man. <laughs> now, I got curious about who could fucking share an award with Faye Dunaway with, after this film, so I watched the trailer for um, Tarzan, the Ape Man, and at no point does Bo Derek consume a child whole. <laughs> so I think... I think this is Rotten Tom- This is, um... I'm pretty sure I called it the Rotten Tomatoes <laughs> award ceremonies earlier. I didn't mean that. I meant Golden Raspberry. I was going to say, the, an idiot. it's nice to hear the Rotten uh, Tomatoes are getting on board with that negativity boat. Brilliant. <laughs> golden Raspberry. Just control F, replace everything I just said with Golden Raspberry. Literally everything. Literally everything. Every word. I think this is uh, the Golden Raspberries getting into its rich tradition of nominating a film they didn't like in every category, regardless of whether or not it actually deserved to win in that category. <laughs> What a bunch of shit. Ah, oh, they're doing the Lord's work. No three men, but Mara Hobel, who played young Christine, the little girl. Mm-hmm. She's in The Happening. Is no. she? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm glad she's still working, to be honest. <laughs> and not just in some kind of witness protection program. <laughs> <laughs> From Faye Dunaway, who's gone really <laughs> method now. <laughs> I mean, she was the best thing in it, I, I will argue. We, we'll, we'll probably get to performances, but I would argue mm. that young Christina is by far giving the best performance in the film. Yeah, I think there's an argument to be made there. I think she's really good. I look forward to that argument. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's probably fair. Who was she in The Happening? Was she like 
a hot dog guy's daughter. <laughs> no, she was just a, a woman on... She was a hot dog. She was just a woman on the bus with them. I meant to check to see if she had any lines, but no, she's just sort of around. Uh, yeah. She's probably the, the, the person going, is it terrorists? As they throw themselves to bears or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> My God, what kind of terrorists are these? I am reintroducing the fan favourite element of this show. Oh, what a lovely score. <laughs> segment in which we celebrate all the times that great film composers slummed it. Henry Mancini. Potentially Mancini? Let's go Mancini. Uh, you might recognise him as written as having written this. Or perhaps you know him for this. fucking wrote. <laughs> huh. Or perhaps you recognise the Peter Gunn television series theme. Not by name, but I think you might recognise it by sound. And yes, here he provides the music for Mommy Dearest. Bizarrely, the film features on two of the top 100 lists by the American Film Institute. Back in the early noughties, they did a bunch of top 100 lists, like top 100 best balls in films and such. <laughs> and um, I know, my listeners at home. Where's yours? <laughs> Crawford is number 41 on the villains list beating out the likes of Jack Nicholson's Joker and Alan Rickman's Hans Gruber. Wow. And the line, no wire hangers ever, was chosen as the 72nd best line in cinema. <laughs> ever. Deserved. Thoroughly deserved. <laughs> <laughs> All in the delivery. To be fair, ever since seeing it, I can't think of any other lines from cinema, so... <laughs> yeah, I was trying to quote one that would have ostensibly been placed b below it, but no, I can't think. Frankly, my dear, no more wire hangers. I love you. Wire hangers! <laughs> Oh god, it made good money and has a divisive legacy to this day. So, Paul and John, you Hollywood royalty. Uh, hi. Why we watch Mommy Dearest? <laughs> Why are we watching this film? Well, for me, <laughs> kind of, I'm a fan of your podcast. I really like the show. Mm. Aww. And, yeah, and you guys do, I know you guys do a lot of bad films. Obviously, that's kind of the point. So, I think there's a specific kind of bad film, which is, which you definitely haven't encountered before, which is camp. And I think this film is like the, the definitive kind of camp classic. And I thought I was really interested to have a conversation about kind of what that means to you guys. And, you know, because not every bad film is camp and not every camp film is bad. Mm -hmm. But this film really, I think, hits that perfect sweet spot where the two lines on the Venn diagram kind of combine. Yeah, I'm, I'm, for, I'm, for, I mean, personally for me, my interpretation, I think there's so many different interpretations of what camp is. And mm. I mean, I think The Simpsons actually got it best when they said uh, it's the ludicrously tragic and the tragically ludicrous, <laughs> which this film certainly has in spades. I mean, when you put those words into the mouth of someone like John Waters, it's just going to make it true. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. yeah. It sounds true even if it's not, but I mean, <laughs> this film certainly flirts with that. But also, my favourite kind of bad films are films that, like this uh, aspiring to something so much greater like you know mm -hmm. I, I don't particularly enjoy films like sharknado i don't think sharknado mm. is a camp classic because it knows exactly what it is exactly this mm. film faye dunaway really thought she was going to win an oscar yeah. for this yeah she and really did that to me is so much more compelling than someone just being like oh wink wink nudge nudge yeah so i do find this film compelling and also endlessly quotable and <laughs> everything about the making of this film is fascinating it's just i just felt like there was if you're doing a podcast about ill-fated movies, at some point you had to do this. So I just thought I would bring it in to the table. I'm surprised I was the first one to suggest it, to be honest. <laughs> oh, interesting. So it's not just hatred and spite. <laughs> well, that too, yeah. Reason yeah. for it. Marvellous. That's really great. So, before we get into all of that, let's have a quick rundown. What happens in Mommy Dearest? Oh, God. Well, there's some classic face scrub at the beginning, isn't there? Oh, yeah. She's really going at it. She's got to make sure all of those tiny microbes are dead. This scene to me really sets the tone because it is five full minutes no, it's, i think six full minutes of no dialogue of just watching 
Joan Crawford prepare for something, and we don't even mm. see her face yeah. particularly. And it builds and builds and builds and builds. Oh, this is really building to something. And then it finally reaches its destination. She turns around and you know she says, "I'm ready." And then it just cuts to something else entirely. Whatever it was building to, we never see. <laughs> and that is kind of emblematic of this movie. Mm. Like there are no connective <laughs> tissues in this movie. Everything just lurches from one seemingly disconnected set piece to another and it's very hard to have any sense of space or time in this film there's nothing really to hold yeah. on to yeah mm. It's kind of like, like making a patchwork quilt, starting in one corner and then going from the, that corner to the next and then to the next and to the next, but never remembering to fill in the middle of it. Yeah. So you just got a whole bunch of rags. Yeah. And it happens a lot, but the first scene is a great example of that because it's so very long. And you're, like, you're waiting for so long for something, yeah. anything to happen other than just watching someone wash their face in a lot of ice. And then when it finally arrives, it just takes this whole hard left turn. It's truly bizarre. Cho- one of the many truly bizarre editorial choices in this film. <laughs> mm. but i mean it's a patrick bateman style morning routine isn't it mm-hmm. <laughs> it's esta- established it just establishes the, yeah. the sort of mental state of this person and then we go off to some innocuous scene and i can't even remember what the next scene was no well we get a few scenes of her with her um david hassel more <laughs> roger hoff <laughs> yeah. Russell hoff we get some scenes with him because he is a, sh- a big shot sort of um film producing guy is he either m or g or m is he I a think lawyer he's just a lawyer i don't think he's, he's a like, lawyer a studio right. boss yeah okay Okay, right. Affiliated with MG or M. That's right, because he is going to try and help her find work. He's going to bend mm. the law, as she says. By which he means yeah. rough up some executives. His MO for the adoption agencies, because she also wants oh, that's it. That's some, to adopt some children, and they won't give it to her for the reason, as he put it, uh, you're mental <laughs> and an actress. Um, you're Joan Crawford. When you polish the floor, you have to move the tree. If you can't do something right, don't do it at all. Yeah, so bend, bend the law, please. I know you just said all that about me being unseatable, but anyway, bend the law. Okay. But then again, the same thing happens again. We get this scene where Faye... Um, sorry, where Joan Crawford is wanting to adopt this baby and the adoption agent tells her in no uncertain terms, you are not, we do not consider you suitable to be a mother. We see her react to this. And then it just cuts immediately to, oh, here's your baby. Yeah. <laughs> it's Oops. so confusing. But anyway, she has a baby now. She Christina, what a beautiful baby. Oh, it's t- 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 two years later now. They're on a carousel <laughs> and um, it's her birthday party, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She, she's getting lots of presents. Faye Dunaway, um, as Joan Crawford, is dressed up as... Queen of Hearts is <laughs> something like that. It is very Alice in Wonderland, isn't it? It's yeah. She really looks like an oversized doll. Yeah, but at, <laughs> yep. at this early stage, we haven't seen aside from sort of boiling all of the skin off of her body in order to get ready in the morning. We haven't seen her do anything mm. too scary. And the little kid mm. looks like the kid out of Village of the Damned. So I'm still wondering <laughs> if this is going to turn into an Omen-style situation and that she'll be the evil. Well, one. we need to talk about Kevin. <laughs> unreliable narrator yeah what if this whole movie happened and at the very end the social worker takes the kid away and it's like it's okay you're safe now and john crawford's running after like no she's gotta stay locked up and he's like don't worry (laughs) (laughs) she won't be able to get to you and christina's eyes just glow red or something direct to to camera like (laughs) that scene was cut they thought it would detract from the whole child abuse thing but that was the point of the original book (laughs) written by the antichrist there's a slight bit of um not disagreement there's a bit of uh a contretemps there when um she's uh they're getting photo like family photos taken and christina says her dress is dirty so she wants to go up and get changed and joan crawford says no just wait and then the photographer yeah. backs christina and says mm. no no actually it'll mm. it could show up and you see her just start to the, the first of many eruptions under the surface <laughs> of her face there oh that i'm gonna fuck you up death blur <laughs> yeah. is one of my favorite images of the whole film <laughs> It ends the scene on that, if I remember correctly. It just kind of has her staring yeah. off into the mid-distance, ready to kill yeah. whoever she finds. And then, is it the next scene where she's sort of forcing her kid to give away all but one of her presents? Yeah. Yes. And um, fucking Danger Man. Roger Morsosov. Yeah. Yeah. He comes in and is, uh, basically convinces them to keep, let her keep just one more. Or let him keep hold of the bracelet so that she can have it properly at another time. Oh, and John yeah. doesn't like that. Undermining no, her. She goes with again. it, though. Yeah. Yeah. All right, just this once. <laughs> but I am going to abuse you later. <laughs> just you wait. Have, have, have Morselhoff and Joan had sex yet in the shower? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think so. I, I just really Possibly. wanted to, not to go backwards, I just really wanted to flag the, the choice to have her hair literally melt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I found it intensely erotic. erotic. I don't know about you guys, but... Nice. We all love it when that 40s fucking, what do you call it, loaf of bread hairstyle. Yeah, it just, <laughs> it just sort of dissolves. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to like, oh, go fall off her head and just leave her bald. <laughs> oh, you're a person. 
Good lord. We have the mirror sequence. I've just got a list of times when she was abused, really, is my summary of this plot. Yeah, um, well, that's it. You can't really summarize and... a plot because there isn't one. It's just like <laughs> uh, just scenes from a terrible a life. S- sequence of abuse. Yeah. yeah. Well, the next one I've written down is that the little girl is just playing in front of a mirror, pretending to be her mum and doing an acceptance speech, whilst also apparently having slathered a whole bunch of her lotions on her head. Mm. <laughs> It yes. seems, and John Crawford flips her shit and starts cutting off all her hair. You're always rummaging through my drawers, trying to find a way to make people look at you. Why are you always looking at yourself in the mirror? Why are you doing that? Tell me! I'll say this, some of these child abuse scenes are legitimately quite upsetting to watch. They sure are. It really walks that line of being, and again, this is kind of where camp kind of kind of plays in. It's like, it's both upsetting and ridiculous at the same time. Yes. Yeah. Like, the, mo- the moment when the look... Like she's really tearing at that little girl's hair, and I genuinely oh, believe God, yeah. that that little girl's reactions are one hundred percent genuine. I think Faye Dunaway was hurting her. I did make a note of this. I do wonder how much of um, the script or the scenes this little kid was made aware of. Mm-hmm. Yes, was she told that she was going to get smacked and yelled at? I, I really do think her performance and the performances of everyone who's not Faye Dunaway in this film. I think all of the reactions <laughs> are somewhat do come from a somewhat genuine place. Like <laughs> I really <laughs> think every, well, the people have spoken about it actually. Like people on the cast since this film came out, mm. I've come out and said, we were fucking terrified of her. Um, I mean, In that way. Yeah. Maybe she was like a really generous actor to everyone else. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, like, like, wow, you, you really yeah. got a scared performance out of me. She did. She certainly got a terrified performance out of the child. But yeah, I mean, Faye Dunaway was a, a woman in, the, in Hollywood in the 70s. So I'm, I'm sure, I'm not going to judge her too harshly. I'm sure she went for a lot of shit, you know. Mm. But that being said, she does have a reputation, particularly bad reputation for being... Yeah. That shit insane and very hard to work with. The costume designer from this oh, film, yes. Irene, Irene Sharaf. Who came out of retirement said, for this, didn't she? She did and obviously yeah. regretted it because she said, <laughs> if you want to walk into Faye Dunaway's uh, dressing room, make sure you throw a slab of raw meat in there first to distract her. That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's fantastic. Perfect fit for Joan Crawford then, it seems. But I think that, I genuinely think that's another reason why this film is what it is because the reason it's not really directed is because I really, I, I think nobody was in a position to pull her back like that is the, mm. the job of the director on a movie yes. one of many jobs of the director but one of the key ones is to tell an actor when they've gone too far and to pull them back i mean that she blames the director john Cor- um sorry faye dunaway herself said that mm. yeah. you know it's a shame the director wasn't experienced enough to tell to tell actors when they'd gone too far but it's like yeah. i think maybe you should have noticed <laughs> i mean there are there are times where you don't need to be inclusive and hire somebody who is mentally unstable to play someone who's mentally unstable <laughs> Like some, sometimes just a good actor would do. Mm-hmm. You know? so, I mean, what you've got here is a somewhat diva-ish performer. You know what it is? It's Man... Uh, is it Man on the Moon? Where Jim Carrey played mm. Andy Kaufman? Yeah. It's a character who's already a little bit troubled. Method acting as someone who was very difficult <laughs> difficult to yeah. work with. And so it just amplifies and becomes crazy. Let's see if we can get out of her childhood. <laughs> She's playing at one point with a couple of dolls... And John Crawford mm-hmm. fucking sneaks up behind her, and it's like maybe you should stop playing with the door behind you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe start strategically placing yourself a bit yeah. there. It didn't take me child abuse to learn to always sit facing the door. That's just something you learn. That's just yeah. nature. You know? I mean, that's just good Sheng Fe- <laughs> Sheng Fei. You know what? I don't think I've heard anyone mention Feng Shui in about ten years, and so when I reached for it, it was just nonsense. <laughs> it wasn't yeah. real words. No, it's all hej now, isn't it? That's totally <laughs> taken over from Feng Shui. It's taken over from Shang Tsung. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> the Danes. She gets fired by MGM, or let go, so oh, yeah. mm-hmm. she's got to go off to some other studio, and she gets home in the middle of the night, and is just hacking at the rose bush, which I assume is in some way related to MGM. You've got to assume. <laughs> the kids get woken up to help s- sort of with this manic late night gardening at which point we have the immortal line tina bring me the axe and again the reaction of the little girl is <laughs> so priceless it's like she looks genuinely shit scared and also somewhat confused like i, I don't <laughs> i'm not sure how much of it was acting did she was that was bring me the axe in the script or was it an ad lib by Faye? and she's like i'm not gonna hand this woman an axe i don't know what she's gonna do <laughs> I mean, I mean the she, film, do we have an axe? We do have an axe. <laughs> Why do we have an axe? Faye Dunaway put it there earlier. <laughs> and then the image of Faye Dunaway in full evening gown, just hacking and hacking at this rose tree is it's true. I mean, drag queens have made whole careers out of this movie. <laughs> and it seems like that a why. <laughs> What's the next abusive scene? Well, she wins the Oscar. Is it the meat? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Let's get to that. Which is just that she comes down and is given a slab of meat that has at some point mm. had some heat in the same room as it. <laughs> because 
it is it's raw. Still it's rare. <laughs> it's getting yeah. trying to get away from the fork. Yeah. And Joe Crawford's like, eat it. You need good um rare meat. Rare meat is good for you. That's a forties diet. <laughs> eat your rare meat. Finish your cigarettes. Then you can have a cheeseburger. <laughs> So she doesn't eat it. She gets sent to her room hungry. Yeah, that's it. Eat it later. You're going to put it in the fridge for now. Um, And she doesn't. Yeah. So she gets it for breakfast. She gets it for breakfast and it's now gone yellow Mm. and has like stuff growing out of it. It's, um, yeah, it's It's just vegetables. (laughs) And she finally concedes and she says, look, okay, take it, throw it in the trash. Now eat the trash! At some point, Joan Crawford wins the Oscar for Mildred Pierce, which was yep. in real life her, her big comeback role. Mm. Uh, she accepts it. You know, we see her watch because she didn't. She was too nervous to go to the awards, so she faked an illness and accepted the award at home. So we see that scene of this great triumph, and it's the happiest moment of her life. Joan Crawford goes outside, and there's all these photographers and fans waiting outside, and she gives this great kind of Ava Peron on the balcony speech about how she did it for them. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. just about to start singing, but she just doesn't quite. Then she goes inside and leaves young Christina to close the door which she does so slowly and so kind of tentatively well, uh, there's just something about it like it, it reminded me of the scene in the wedding singer with um oh, what's his name john oh, um lovitz yeah when he says he's losing his mind and i'm going to reap all the benefits and then slowly backs yeah. out of the curtain. It, it was kind of that i don't know what it was trying to say well, I mean, but it was yeah, yeah. If, if i had the pap- uh, one of the paparazzi there that night and I was confronted with her slowly closing the door with that look on her face. I would have taken a, a thousand photos and put them on all over the front page of the paper. But like, what is going on here? What? <laughs> this is the real story. Horror in the fucking Crawford household. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Rumours of meat and axolated madness. <laughs> <laughs> You've done it, Goodman. you got the story of the day. Story of the year. <laughs> <laughs> we cut straight from that scene to... Yeah. The probably the other most iconic and also most upsetting scene of child abuse. <laughs> and again, I'm not sure if it's supposed to be the same night, several months or years later. Like it's so <sighs> unclear. Yeah. But from this moment of great triumph, suddenly she's having this whole fit. She seems to already be in some kind of fugue state or something. And then she finds mm. that she goes into little Christine's room in the dead of night. Yeah. The two little kids are in there. If... There's also the son who has all of two. Yes, and who is on. chained to the bed. It's never quite explained. <laughs> <laughs> Go back. Strap yourself in. <laughs> the scene, the scene where the maid comes in and just whips the covers off, and he's got fucking. Yeah. I laughed so hard. It was like a naked. It was like an airplane reveal. It was so funny. Apparently that's true. Apparently the yeah. reason the kid was the, the, was strapped down was because he had a sleepwalking issue. But the film never takes any <laughs> time to explain that. It just assumes we'll know. That that's why this. You just assume that Faye Dunaway asked for it to be cut. Irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> Am I in it? No. Yes. Am I in it? <laughs> I'll pay the bed. So then Faye finds the wire hangers. That her daughter's clothes are hanging on wire hangers, which apparently she finds very obsessing. Yeah. Um, leading to the AFI approved line. No wire hangers! What's wire hangers doing in this closet when I told you no wire hangers ever? A daughter! Who cares as much about the beautiful dresses I give her as she cares about me? What's wire hangers doing in this closet? Answer me! Apparently, I read somewhere that it was because she hated being reminded of her own poverty mm-hmm. or something like that, or, or she, like she was made to work in a dry cleaners when right. she was young, and I don't know, something to do with that. It was, it was all very good reasoning mm. for screaming sure. at a child. <laughs> in the yeah, middle of the night. It. Where's she getting it anyway? I love this movie does come from a place of truth, but it kind of the way it presents it is so bizarre <laughs> that it's incomprehensible. Because yeah, <laughs> Joan Crawford was raised in extreme poverty. That's something that's well known about her. So she was mm. always felt somewhat of a an imposter when she became mm. A, mm. a Hollywood star. So which probably played into whatever underlying mental health problems she was suffering yeah. as well. So yeah, never yeah. explored in the film. Well, yeah, I mean, this is genuinely hard to watch. Like, she brutally beats Christina with the wire hanger. Yeah, and then she kind of then there's the cleaning scene. So she she she's been a sta- well established as like o- an OCD kind of neat freak. Yeah. 
and she's kind of imagining that the bathroom floor is dirty and she she sprays all this is it ajax they used to use all this powder yeah, that, yeah. all over probably the floor highly it's, acidic it's just lime caustic yeah oh yeah yeah exactly and well it, it, it's it's such it's hard to describe but it's such a like this, this entire if this entire film is at 11 if phase at 11 for this entire film this film is this scene is like a 15 mm. yeah like there's or 20 like it, it's just so much it's so draining and aggressive the floor's already clean so she screams and screams at the little girl she beats her with the wire hangers and makes her scrub the floor and then Faye Dunaway just kind of stomps out of the scene says clean this mess up figure it out mm. and we're left with this image of this little girl sitting on this dirty floor just kind of you know traumatized and sobbing but then there's this great moment where <laughs> little Christina essentially breaks the fourth wall, I believe. Yeah. And just kind of almost looks direct to camera and just goes, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. That was amazing. Preceded only briefly by just the reveal, the so funny reveal that this whole scene has played out. It's been horrible. It's been loud. It's been aggressive it's moved around the place it's ended up in the bathroom the conjoining bathroom and only as Faye Dunaway swans her way out of the scene is it revealed that little fucking Timmy the other kid has been in the corner of the room the entire time <laughs> just presumably watching all of this oh yeah because that's where he does he, he gets up doesn't he he offers to help yeah. he says I'll help you clean up and she goes no go back strap yourself in mm. <laughs> that ends um, somehow. <laughs> and we now get the Christmas broadcast, where they're mm. being ter- intimidated, and the broadcaster is like, well, your children sure are well-behaved and terrified. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to raise my kids with an axe. I enjoyed the tension of these scenes a lot. I really did. Like, the- these mm. kind of mm. underlying... I'm where- watching yeah. her kids. Mm. Like, watching... Sorry, just watching them perform and, like, nodding along with them as they as they get things mm. right. It's really unsettling. It is, it is. And I, I, again, not to... Re- like repeat myself but i really feel like this comes from half you know acting the scene and half a legitimate terror that if they screw up a line this crazy woman sat next to them is probably going to go nuts yeah. she's still got the yeah. axe from several scenes earlier <laughs> yes. why do you still have that <laughs> way Faye done away now at this stage we can transition because we're nearly at the end of the childhood here little christina back chats to one of um joan crawford's bows you know doing a little bit of shaming honestly mm. but um it's probably mm. the part of Joan Crawford's life that deserves to be shamed the least is that she's had a, f- a number of male love interests. Mm. Christina calls calls her on it, and she decides to ship her off to boarding school. One of the great, again, abrupt transitions in this film, where it just goes straight yeah. from, she interrupts her when she's kind of in an intimate moment with this guy, and it's like, boom, boarding school. It really made me laugh. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like, boom, teenager, apparently. Yeah. She was working through a rough wig. Oh, man. <laughs> Good lord. I heard they cast the child actor after they cast the adult uh, lady because they wanted someone who's going to look like her. So did mm-hmm. they then cast her hair based on what the yeah. child's hair looked like? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that wig had its own casting process. It had its own agent. It auditioned <laughs> several times. It was the real demon. Got a sag here. card out of this. You know. <laughs> Faye Dunaway hated that wig. Did it have yeah. its vanity shots, but just on like different people's heads? Yeah. <laughs> Such versatility. <laughs> Look, Roger Moore w- wore it for a whole season of um, Danger Man. Not Danger Man. What was this show called? Oh, anyway. Danger Man. Danger Man. Danger Bond. <laughs> um, yeah, clearly it's the most famous role. They couldn't possibly have gone for Bond. They had to reach for fucking Danger Man. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, you know, the star of The Saint, Roger Moore. Oh, The Saint. I could have gone for The Saint. Is Danger Man a thing? So she's she's in boarding school and she's she's doing all right. She's as far spiritually and physically from <laughs> from Joan Crawford as she possibly can be. She's honing her acting craft. Patrick McGowan was in Danger Man. Oh, okay, brilliant. <laughs> um, she's got a friend in um, in Happy Days. Yeah, yeah, she's doing all right. But unfortunately for her, Happy Days over there wants wants a bit of kissing and smooching oh, and uh, in a barn. In a barn, just like we we all do and did. Every school, what school doesn't have a what barn? school doesn't have a barn exactly. <laughs> Um, <laughs> for the nuns to pray yeah, <laughs> yeah. feast upon hay and, I mean it's asking for trouble if this school has a very abstentemious kind of you know policy then having an open barn just adjoining the building <laughs> is a it's big, a test big now no frolicking in our barn 95% of the students pass the test no engaging in our pillow fight room <laughs> it's just full of pillows I was trying to think of other erotic settings uh, st- there's a waterfall behind the place strict catholic school upbringing 
That's a, that's a room. There's the alley from Spider-Man 2. <laughs> Spider-Man 1, what's wrong with me? Anyway. And then there's just Elizabeth Berkeley. <laughs> and um, but anyway, she she's caught canoodling and um, it's jo- Joan Crawford just, you know, <laughs> yeah. just loses it. She blames everyone and everything, e- everyone and everything for what isn't a problem. Although she is 13, but we can be forgiven for for being okay with it because she looks like she's 38. I really couldn't tell how old old Christina was supposed to be at any given time. No, yeah. it was a problem. I mean, this film is apparently meant to represent 39 years of time, and she mm-hmm. gets Christine quite early on in the film. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> It's not. It could ease. It could just as easily just be like three separate days in Joan Crawford's life: the day she gets a baby, <laughs> the day she has young Christine, and the day she has old Christine. <laughs> just three action-packed days. Well, it felt like it because there was a good twenty years or so where Christina didn't age at all, and there was a good twenty, <laughs> thirty years where Joan Crawford doesn't age either. <laughs> Let me just introduce um, a little part here where I can sample the uh, little exchange between the head nun, uh, the nun master, and Joan Crawford over the issue of reacting, specifically <laughs> the amount of which is is appropriate. I think you're overreacting, Miss Crawford, and I think you're underreacting, Mrs. Chadwick. She's not not a nun. The, the nunnery comes later. Wait, I, I, I'll accept that she's not a nun, but the nunnery comes later? There's more nunnery stuff? Yeah, the second school is the nunnery. Oh, she's sent to a nunnery after she's throttled almost to death by Dan Oh, Crawford. okay, well that's coming up next, so let's do that. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, she, yeah, she has a reporter round. She's just having dinner with her when <laughs> yeah. the daughter comes round. And they decide to have a bit of a chat, a bit of a catch up down the hall. So they walk <laughs> five. Excuse me a second. Excuse Julie. me a second, um, uh, Barbara. Barbara. <laughs> Just yeah. <laughs> well, I wonder why the name stuck in my head. Y- you wait here, Barbara. But she goes down the. They go five steps out of the room and decide to have a violent confrontation with each other. During which Barbara tries to interject. Q. Barbara, please, please, Barbara. Barbara, please, <laughs> please, Barbara. <laughs> Um, okay, says Barbara. It seems fine. Off I go. <laughs> and then about five minutes later, when the, the, the sounds of strangling haven't actually stopped, she goes, no, hang on. This is too much. This is getting a Or bit maybe much. the maid comes in and goes, what are you doing? The, she's dying in your Come room. On. Well, no, she said, please. And then asked me, if I said jump off a roof, please, would you do it? <laughs> what if Joan Crawford did it? If he said it the way Joel Crawford <laughs> did, yeah, I would. I'd be too scared to do otherwise. Why can't you give me the respect? That I'm entitled to! Why can't you treat me the way that I would be treated by any stranger on the street? Because I am not one of your fans! <laughs> So this scene where um, Joan is throttling young Christina, it was originally directed that both Barbara and Carol Ann would both like drag Joan Crawford off, off Christina. But in the filming, the actress who played Barbara refuses to refused to get anywhere near Fade Away because she's like she's going to actually hurt me. <laughs> so it's left to poor Carol. Ge- this is genuinely not, uh, something that happened. So it, uh, uh, poor Carol Ann is the only one who drags her off consequently, while Barbara just kind of hangs around at a safe distance. And to that I say... <laughs> In a full body well, armor. Well, good core armor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Carol Ann was doubled at that one scene by um, Macho Man Randy Savage, <laughs> who was required as a body double to try and match Faye Dunaway's sheer energy. Oh, Christ. So, right, a lot of things happen here, but Faye Dunaway gets a new husband. The head of Pepsi Cola. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, or the inventor of, or just high up in the marketing. Director, Terry Pepsi Cola. P- Terry Pepsi Cola. They are doing something to a house. I think they're renovating an apartment. Yeah. yeah. Faye Dunaway demonstrates... I keep saying Faye Dunaway. John Crawford demonstrates a somewhat fundamental lack of understanding of what a load-bearing wall is. <laughs> <laughs> Tear down that bitch of a bearing wall and put a window where it ought to be. And then he dies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, so quickly and so abruptly. <laughs> It is <laughs> It is a fantastic... There are two cuts in this movie. When Christina's being strangled um, yeah. and when they're talking about um, this is how good this is going to be for the business fi- and Joan finally convincing Mr. Pepsi-Cola to go with this plan. The first time, it's a hard cut to the nunnery. Yeah. With, and with Mr. Pepsi-Cola, when they go, should we give it a go? <laughs> okay. It's hard cut to Widow. Just, just <laughs> in, morning, in morning garb with people <laughs> just around her on a table going, we're so sorry about the death of your husband. <laughs> 
Is it to imply that she killed him? Um, well, there was something about that around the book. The daughter said something to the effect of, I don't want to imply that my mother killed the head of Pepsi Cola, John <laughs> Pepsi Cola. But it is a little mysterious how a very healthy man just happened to fall down the stairs. <laughs> it's okay. What's his name from the staircases over the corner? It's like, doesn't sound suspicious to me. <laughs> well, next is my favourite scene. It's her versus the board. We have retired you from the board of directors. You drove Al Steele to his grave and now you're trying to stab me in the back? Forget it! I fought worse monsters than you for years in Hollywood. I know how to win the hard way. Miss Crawford, we don't want any hard feelings. You don't know what hard feelings are until I come out publicly against your product and you see how much you sick. Please, Miss Crawford. It's hardly necessary to make threats you surely don't mean. Don't fuck with me, fellas! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the light and shade of the performance is really comes to play here. Like it's a she's really doing soft <laughs> politics in this scene. <laughs> This is, Anyone? you see, if she was trying to sort out Brexit, yes. I feel like <laughs> we'd be, we'd have had a no deal about six months ago. <laughs> it would have been great. Yeah. This would be an apocalyptic wasteland and we'd all be happy. <laughs> My next note, see if you can figure out what this is a relation to, just says, come on, 50s, this didn't actually fucking happen, did it? Uh, that I believe that's sitcom related. That is sitcom related. Oh, yes. And it did in fact happen. Yes. It sure yeah. did. Not sitcom, mm-hmm. sorry, soap. It was a oh, okay, one of those yeah. trashy fifty soaps yeah, that the daughter I <laughs> that the daughter had scored a scored a role in. Good for her; she's yeah. making a go of it. Oh dear, she has an ovarian cyst. Well, I mean, surely there's nothing sinister, incredibly awkward, or weird that Joan Crawford could do in reaction to her daughter getting an ovarian cyst, is there? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, she could replace her on the soap and play an eighteen-year-old character. As a woman in her sixties, who is visibly drunk, drunk, yeah, (laughs) yeah, and she does. What a time to be alive! You know that just that just happens. No, there's no best generation. You know, I was expecting that scene where a newspaper spins to the front of the screen. It's like crazy star Joan Crawford ruins everything. (laughs) What the fuck happened? The the newspaper says. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. What happened to Barb? What was the fallout from Barbara's story when she literally witnessed the, you know, Joan Crawford strangling her daughter Nellie to death? Did that just? Did she just decide to omit that detail? <laughs> Nothing seems yeah. to have any fallout for her. Yeah. I mean, at that at that stage, the only all that's left really yeah. is Joan Crawford is old. Um, Christina comes and accepts an award for something for Joan Crawford for just being great. Like I think. Life's <laughs> achievement, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, and true. as. As she was when she was younger, she performs. Uh, she performs the role perfectly, praising her mum, her mom, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like the mirror scene. Cut to Joan Crawford dead in a coffin. Yeah, looking remarkably Cut to like. Dead. <laughs> looking remarkably like any minute now, she's gonna open <laughs> her eyes and Carrie yeah. style claw her way through the fucking screen. <laughs> it would have been entirely consistent with the tone of this movie had she done that. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't have doubted it for a minute. It, you know what? It would have been like the end of Behind the Candelabra when um, mm. Michael Douglas's body just flies out of the coffin and starts floating around. <laughs> oh God, God! But anyway, um, last scene. There's a will reading, um, and it transpires <laughs> that Christina and Chris, uh, Christopher is his name. Who's Fucking, still a character? Um, yes, <laughs> remember him? He's still yeah. chained to the bed, and he's now being played by dad from terminator 2 foster dad from terminator 2 <laughs> they are told that they are going to receive nothing from the estate to which um terminator 2 dad says huh jaws had to have the last word and she's done it again but i i can't get his line right to make the grammar of what she says in reply make sense but she says um she always gets the last word yeah i think that's just it she always has that's to it. it does she does she book the end. Although, <laughs> yeah, I think that, that that's another interesting thing about this film is that it. I think throughout it really implies a great deal of knowledge of the life and times of Joan Crawford. And I guess you know now she's kind of been culturally rehabilitated in some ways by feud and stuff as, as well. But oh yes, like the, I was really expecting there would be some text at the end saying like you know shortly afterwards Christina is a best-selling book detailing her abuse and you know she, she uh, made it. She's yeah, like, but it didn't. It just ends on that. Like, now it's just now yeah, you got to read the book. It just implies <laughs> that there's going to be a book. But yeah, it assumes that you know. I guess yeah, mm, it's, absolutely. It's, Say mm. odd. What do you guys make of that? Well, I'll be honest. I've seen this film upwards of ten times. So um, right, wow. <laughs> it, it didn't have a lot that was new for me. Um, mm. I will. I'll say that I do think it's more enjoyable for for the 
infamous bits. If I was going to recommend this to someone, I might recommend they just watch a 10 minute compilation of Faye's craziest line reads rather than sit through the whole film, <laughs> which is t- genuinely quite upsetting in places, even though it, it is really lovely. is. Um, well, some commentators, interestingly, sort of want to emphasize those parts as being mis- uh, misunderstood. Alex Davison wrote an article for the BFI in which he defended the movie, saying, Those who revel in the absurdity are missing out on the film's genuine qualities. The film is at its best when it shows some affection for poor Joan. Dunaway does an excellent job of conveying Crawford's fear of returning to poverty, and ironically, Mm. a terror of ridicule and rejection from her devotees. And I stand by the wire coat hanger scene. As an adult viewer, the sequence is ridiculous. But as a child, it was a scary roller coaster ride. Coming straight after a scene of Crawford at her happiest, having won an Oscar, it showed the terrifying unpredictability of living with an unstable parent. Interesting read. So if you're a child, then that's <laughs> a convincing scene. <laughs> more, more under fives should be made to watch this film. Yes, yeah. it must be gotten in early. I don't know, it just reminds me of um, The Shining. You know, a film I really love dearly, mm. but I will acknowledge that Jack Nicholson's performance is Looney Tunes. Mm-hmm. Mm. But again, I did watch it as a kid, and when you're a kid, it's really scary. Yeah. I just think it's not how you portray something like this. Yeah. I mean, not, not, I'm not saying camp is inherently unsuitable for this, but and, and if you do want to have, you do want to have her sort of explosive and aggressive like that, which is good because there's an unreliability and unpredictability to the abuse, and that makes it scary. Mm. But the, the mistake that this film makes for me is just it writes the lines, it sets up a wide shot and just says go and then there's no real reason for shooting it that way. So rather than concentrating on the tension or like the claustrophobia of, of these scenes or the fact that, you know, as a child you can't escape that, it has the whole shot showing all of Faye Dunaway's body doing really weird, goofy <laughs> things mm. at the same at the same time as you're supposed to be watching something really, uh, really terrible yeah. on screen. When she's pulled off of Christina um, after mm. throttling her, you know, it's it's like ultimate Nick Cage mega acting, mm. but in an abuse film. Yeah. And it just, uh, I, I don't know. It doesn't even know where the line is to walk it for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's that's fairly true. I was watching a documentary which interviewed the screenwriter and producer of this film, uh, Frank Yablans. Yablans? Yablans. Mm. And it's revealing yeah. because he talks, all he talks about is Joan Crawford, about how he met mm. her once, he became obsessed with her, and, you know, the rigidity of her and the sort of Nosferatu like frame mm. that she had. And it's just about how he wanted to make a film about her, and he barely mentions Christine throughout the whole thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Add to that, uh, Ratanya Adler, who played um, Alda, sorry, who played um, Marianne? Caroline. Caroline. Caroline, sorry. Um, she claimed in her own tell all book about the making <laughs> of this film that Faye Dunaway manipulated the director to deprive her co stars of screen mm. time. Add all that together, and what you have is a movie that f- wants to fetishize its own monster. She might yeah. be a heartless monster, but look how fabulous she was. You know, she was like a diva, and they don't make child abusers like that anymore. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> idea. Um, well, yeah, I mean, Christina's yeah. perspective itself is quite lacking. I found. Yeah, I agreed. I never got any real sense of what Christina was was feeling, or particular, other than blind, naked terror. But mm. and I think <laughs> that's I mean, the Jesus Christ. Yeah, exactly. The, the most real moment in the movie. But yeah. yeah, I think that again, I return to the phrase: it's light and shade. Like this film doesn't have mm. light and shade. It doesn't have those little connective scenes where you see. Yeah, it does absolutely probably portray the inconsistency of someone who is suffering from severe mental health problems yeah. you know and mm. is an abuse abuser you know that go from zero to 60 so fast you know mm. i'm assuming this this iteration of joan crawford if not the real deal is supposed to be you know what we would now understand to be bipolar or something but yeah. because it doesn't have any there's no scenes where she's not either zero or 60 yeah, then yeah. It's, it's really hard to get a handle on anything because you're just watching <laughs> crazy crazy abuse or crazy crazy behavior or you're watching her be her seeming to be filled with joy and happiness and there's really nothing yeah. in between yeah, yeah it just it ends up looking ridiculous and comedic is the problem mm. and, and, it, and it's it, yeah it ceases to be a portrayal of, of abuse or mental illness and all these things but just a send-up of joan crawford and it's worth saying that the studios acknowledged that it was developing a reputation very early on as being a sort of very funny film and so they stopped marketing it as a sort of taut drama an oscar worthy drama and started trying to sell it as like a comedy a black mm. comedy Mm-hmm. Which, uh, but which they basically did by putting out a poster with her sort of leering face on it, um, with a coat hanger in the poster, and apparently the tagline, uh, "the biggest mother of them all," but I couldn't find a poster with that tagline on God. it, so I don't know about that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it's very hard to get in the mindset of someone who would show up expecting a comedy from this. Yeah. <laughs> 
because I, I will say those sequences were amazing. The ones where she properly goes nuts. The strangulation scene, the wire yeah. hanger scene, the rose garden. Yeah. It's, it's you know, acting at 110%. It's real Elizabeth Berkeley style. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah. exactly that. And it's, again, same thing. Like, it's Faye Dunaway thought she was going to win Oscar. You know, Elizabeth Berkeley. And the reason Showgirls works is as well as it does, and is, and again, a camp classic for many people, mm-hmm. is that not everybody involved. I feel like in that film, Gina Gershon knew what she was in. But Elizabeth Berkeley did not. <laughs> and you can tell in the differences between their performance. Yeah. Gina Gershon is really vamping it up and really relishing the, mm. the lines, whereas Elizabeth Berkeley is just so committed to the material that she's working with. And I feel like with this, it's at an extra level of interest because you're dealing with a genu- an actress who is genuinely capable of greatness. You know, Faye Dunaway, when directed yeah. well, was in Bonnie and Clyde and, you know, oh, Network gotcha. and yeah, China China so many great films. So... She's not, yeah. It's not like she's out of her depth. She's just not being directed mm. well. I mean, Paul Verhoeven directed Elizabeth Berkeley in that way, right? Mm-hmm. She, you know, he told her to do yes. it. And the point of her character was that she brought too much aggression and not enough control. Sure. Or too much energy and not enough control to her dancing. And it was there in, you know, in the mm. way that she interacted with people and just went about her daily life. She was too real. Too real for everyone. Camp works for me in that film. We talked before about Nicolas Cage about Nicolas Cage and you know when is when is his mega acting appropriate and in something like Vampire's Kiss it fits the mark perfectly but if Nicolas Cage were to suddenly portray I don't know um who who is like the domestic abuser was it Gregory Peck or Errol Flynn oh god I hope it wasn't Gregory Peck Uh, it's probably Errol I think it might have been Errol Flynn actually you know if he was doing that a nuanced performance is what's going to be appropriate there not something from Vampire's Kiss if he was to suddenly go in and throwing things about and and wailing and screeching before pushing someone down the stairs they jar so I, th- I think there's times where camp really really works and for this it it, uh, it really misses the mark and yet mm. i think so but it, it does and well, yet I was gonna, and yeah because I, I i intellectually agree with you completely like but by the same <laughs> time it is one or it is right up there with showgirls and not just for me personally but you know you mentioned like rupaul's drag race and you know it, it is a genuine iconic camp movie so for many people it does succeed on that level you know what i try to imagine it playing to a cult crowd mm-hmm. though because obviously it has yeah. it's done very well and when i think of showgirls i just imagine me in that crowd just thinking oh great it's this mm-hmm. scene on every mm-hmm. scene <laughs> every scene that starts i'm gonna be like fuck it's this mm-hmm. one mm-hmm. With Mommy Dearest, it's going to be like, oh, it's the bit in the car where they're driving and it takes forever. Mm. I mean, you said earlier that a, 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 a kind of, you know, six and a half minute montage, or probably longer than that, more like a 15 minute montage of some of the more alarming scenes might be more entertaining in the way that people expect this to be as a cult movie. Mm. Um, because you do have a lot of very dour scenes of abuse, frankly, yeah. and it, it can be very dispiriting. Oh, yeah, there's certainly an ick factor, you know, especially because, again, mm. it is... <laughs> Based on a, I mean, it's it's the, there, there have been disputes about different people have different opinions about the degree to which the book is accurate, whether Christina Crawford exaggerated yes. mm. the degree to which she was abused or whether she was telling mm. the truth. And you know, we now live in a culture where you know, we, you know, we very much believe the abuser, which I obviously agree with entirely. So, sorry, believe the abuse, mm. believe the abuse, not believe the abuser. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> God, uh, <laughs> that's the hill I'm going to die on. Um, but, <laughs> I did find myself wondering. Okay, so Come on, guys. let's say Christina Crawford's book is entirely accurate. What mm. must what must she feel watching this film? Yes, and watching people w- with a crowd of people, people laughing, laughing at it. At yeah, what was for her? Yeah, nightmare. and she's come out and said that this film was ludicrous, and she yes that the it was so over the top. And she even she even actually used a phrase that I thought was really interesting. It wasn't just that she said the film was inaccurate. She said, "My mother didn't deserve this." That's so really she interesting. She feels that the film hmm. does her mother a disservice, That's not just that it's inaccurate. So. She must have really yet, complicated yeah. feelings about it. And yet, what was the intention of writing the book if it was to sort of expose what happened to her in childhood? I mean, we're sat here talking about Mommy Dearest. A good... When was this movie made? 1981? Yeah. 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 A good... Uh, so, a good maths, 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 maths. 30, almost 40 years. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah, almost 40 years since it was made. Um... Would we be doing so if it was a sort of very straight down the, down the lane, you know, straight laced drama which accurately portrayed the terrible abuse? I mean, we might have seen it before now, and we probably wouldn't be recording on our bad movie podcast <laughs> uh, an episode about it. But yes, I suppose yeah. if it was, I don't know that there are Oscar winning sort of drama exposés from back then that you know I haven't gotten around to watching. Yeah, like Kramer versus Kramer, for example. So. Mm. I don't know if I'd have watched Mommy Dearest, the serious drama, if not for crazy bug eyes. Yeah, I mean, but away. does it get the does it get any discussion started on abuse and mental illness, or is it just that's true? Is it just 
a massive misfire. <laughs> Is it just jokes now? Yeah. Yeah. Hard to say. Yeah, I mean, the, the book itself has had its 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 fair share of critics and defenders. You know, people the mm. equal number of people I think have stood up for it and verified you know stories of abuse. And most amazingly, Betty Davis um, de- decried it. She actually said, <laughs> yes. you know, famously we've had our differences, but that book was repulsive. So. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then her own daughter wrote a, wrote a kind of knockoff, Mommy Dearest, after she, before she died. Oh, really? Uh, Betty Davis's yeah. daughter did? Yes, she did. Um, I, I, yeah, a, a very similar... Like, I don't think that... De- obviously, that she didn't accuse of the degree of abuse, but right. certainly a very, very unflattering book about Betty Davis that um, ca- that was released before Betty Davis died, and their relationship mm. never recovered. So I mean, they oh, were pretty yeah. bad to each other in whatever happened to Baby Jane, and it was... Yeah. yeah. It was very reciprocal. <laughs> each other. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to bear this in mind for the kids. Yeah. So I wonder if their oh, understanding no. of abuse was was the same. Oh, mm, quite you possibly, know. yeah. It's like, oh, that's not abuse. I do that every day. <laughs> I mean, there was just, uh, it's no excuse for any of this, of course. There were plenty of people who raised their kids very well back in these days. But it was a time before the long-term effects of some of this stuff was greatly understood. Mm. You know, there was very little studying of the impact of <laughs> locking a kid to a bed would have on their grown-up self. Yeah, i.e. then sure. becoming a Tory MP. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it is... I really... There were some moments in this in which I was really fiercely entertained. There were a fair few where I was quite bored. Um, That's... It yeah. is a, it's a long old film. It's two hours and, you know, ten I, minutes. I, I would say that I checked the time about every 15 minutes i'm afraid for me it was just a bit a bit too much on the dull side with uh exciting horrifying moments few and far between which is not to say that i came in thinking god i hope there's lots of abuse in this but there was um you know but, well um what else is it offering really you know that's all it's well, to give yeah. so. well exactly and if, if i guess if you're then going in and be like not enough abuse in this to keep it interesting then <laughs> it speaks of a deeper problem well yeah but i mean if it was a compelling character study like you know something like Mm. We need to talk about Kevin style or something like you mentioned. Sure. Then the lack of you know extreme incident wouldn't be as problematic. Yeah. But, yes, exactly. And could you still give a larger than life performance, but contain it slightly? I and mean, it can so it can be a completely horrifying performance. But you know sometimes you can just capture that performance that's that's so extreme that it's it's utterly believable. It has to be true. I would say you yes, could and I would still point, do that. I would I would point to a very recent example actually. Not that she was playing a child abuser. But I would point to the performance of Tony Collette in Hereditary as an example yeah. of a very extreme performance that just stays on the right side of camp. Mm. I found that performance to be fairly comedic in places. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that you're right, it's very close to the line. And yeah, that that could have been something. It's hard to say. I'm trying to think of like a a, a big performance like that where it is. I think it's subjective. I think some people mm. are going to find it very, very silly and very funny. Mm. Others are going to find it quite harrowing, like I do mm. with you know Jack Nicholson in The Shining. I think. Yeah, it's going to come down to the individual. So I wonder, you know, there are people who would have gone through that kind of experience and then saw Mommy Dearest. Mm. And Been like uh, the reviewer said about watching it as a child, you know, it, it's terrifying. Mm. If you have those memories that can take you right back to that position of insecurity, you know, the danger of, of, of being a child in that position, then I think it's still going to speak to that. What is that old line about comedy? It's just tragedy plus time. So yeah. it, it's just the idea that... Unless you're Frankie Boyle. Okay, it's just tragedy and then <laughs> open your mouth. <laughs> well, look, let, let's let's try and conclude on this before we quick fire. I think, uh, for me, it was a movie that... I, I, I already... It's weird. When I was watching it, I don't think I was terribly happy, but I'm already looking back on it somewhat fondly. It's straight I, Like, all day and, and tonight, when I got in, I thought, oh, I'll watch a bit more of it. And I felt, now that I know where it goes, i.e. not really anywhere, it just is a catalogue of <laughs> extraordinary sequences with, you know, an incredible performance at the heart of it from Dunaway. Um, there is something compellingly watchable about it. I guess I can understand its status as a cult film. But um, it's definitely, it's like you say, a key component of a cult film is that it must have failed to accomplish what it set out to do. And it most certainly failed to be an mm. expose of, or an insight into Joan Crawford. Mm-hmm, because yeah. it's just sheer madness and really only serves as an insight into Faye Dunaway yeah. and the interests of the producers. That might be the film's true legacy. Is If it achieves anything, it is probably, it is a genuinely compelling character study, but the character that it studies is Faye Dunaway. <laughs> yeah. It says so much more about her than it does about Joan Crawford, Christina Crawford, or anyone else who appears in this movie. Mm. And there's, there's something to that, I think. Yeah. And also her, yeah, and her career as well, because her career, you know, again, 
to go from the heights that Faye Dunaway was, was at, you know, in the 70s when mm. she made all those so many iconic movies, and then this film comes out and she really never recovered. And, you no. know, there's many factors that probably play into that uh, alleged difficulty to work with, you know, probably didn't maybe yes. be inclined to give her any chances. Mm. Age, good old fashioned ageism as well. Yep. But also, I think I've seen this, some of the same interviews that you have, Paul, uh, uh, with uh, Ritania Alder and other members of the cast who have really kind of embraced the film and, and its kind of gay following, its camp following. And now, mm. you know, can look back on it fondly and like celebrate it and laugh about it. And uh, there was one where the, the actress who played Caroline and Ritania Alder, she said, if, if, if only Joan could just. Sorry, if only Faye... It's so telling that we're constantly... <laughs> if only Faye could yeah. just get over it and, and laugh and find a way to laugh about it. She'd yeah. be in such so, so better, better of a place because she she also famously will not discuss it. Like, yeah, to this day, it does, if it's brought yeah. up in an interview, she will walk out of the interview. So it, she yeah. has no sense of humor about this whatsoever. And that's probably why she's not been able to embrace and go, move past it. Because mm. And then consequently, it has been allowed to define her career. To, I, 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 I'd argue to a greater degree than the genuinely great films that she made at the height of her career. I think this film defines her career. Yeah, it's it's unfortunate sometimes when you do do sort of the thing that you do, but at 110%, um, it suddenly stains all of your previous work because people go back and they see hints of it. And they're mm-hmm. like, oh God, you were already doing it back here. Because, you know, when I think of, you know, my sister, my my daughter, my sister, you know, I am seeing the sort of traces of wire hangers. Yeah, and how many other great actors, male and female, have the potential to give a performance this bad, or you know, or this misjudged, <laughs> if not, you know, directed well? Yeah, I would argue I most mean, of them. I think a bad actor giving a bad performance is boring. A yes. great actor giving a bad performance is m- magnetic in some way. <laughs> Indeed, and <laughs> that's probably the, the key to this movie's appeal. I would say. Mm, I think so. Now, I got curious about what Fade Dunaway is up to these days. Mm-hmm. and discovered that in 2017, in addition to being in a film called The Case for Christ, um, she also appeared in a movie called Inconceivable, starring Faye Dunaway, Gina Gershon, and Nicolas Cage. Oh what? my god. It has 17% on Rotten Tomatoes. I have added it what? to our list. <laughs> what? Please <laughs> call me when you do that episode. I will come back. Yeah, that is our next tie-in episode. <laughs> Oh my Holy god. Shit. Fantastic. Let's quick fire. Quick fire. Uh, I really like the faceless, tense, high intensity scrubbing at the beginning there. I, I, it was a good opening profile of the character. And it was communicated without words, without seeing her face at all. It just really got across so much of her own expectations and what she's going to sort of spill over onto her unfortunate children. <laughs> it really it, it helped set tension that I hoped would be kept mm. for the rest of the film. There's a scene towards the end when. Joan Crawford has gone broke. She's having major financial difficulties and she oh. has to confess that to Christina. And they have this little, this little moment oh, yes. and it's the most genuine moment in the film. And it's one of the oh. only scenes that I would say Faye is giving a genuinely good performance. And it's like mm. it's lifted out of an entirely different movie. And it's like a brief mm. glimpse into the version of this movie that worked. And so I, I just wanted to mm. highlight that because that was one of the few scenes that felt like it was directed and acted appropriately. You know what, I agree with you, and but one of the more alarming parts of that scene is how they bookend it, because the next moment, I think, is um, her getting called up, uh, the daughter getting called up. Because, um, no, she doesn't get called up, she just goes up to see her mum and finds Joan Crawford, like, collapse on a sofa in a really comical, over-the-top, I've-passed-out-drunk mm. position. Yeah. And that, I think, punctuates a very somber scene with right back to whatever this is. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is not the first time Christina has seen Joan drunk. <laughs> My first one is that um, in the scene, another scene we didn't mention, she breaks up with, um, what were we calling him? Roger Muzzlehoff. Muzzlehoff. They break up. And in that scene, he kind of slap- he shakes her around a bit. <laughs> he gives her a damn good shaking to. But the, the thing I liked about it is at the end of the scene... As he walks away, it's revealed that throughout that entire confrontation, she didn't manage to let go of her cigarette. (laughs) It's still perched neatly between her fingers. There was something very old school Hollywood about that that I really liked. I mean, I I would like to talk about Roger Morzelhoff because, I mean, when he does shake her, it's brilliant because he shakes her. And he's, what does he say? It's like, are you crazy? And then he pauses for a second and then just shakes her again. (laughs) <laughs> and, and there are just he has so many moments like that and some some one genuinely good line mm. when he turns up and uh joan goes you're early only an hour and a half <laughs> which is, you know which is great he's got his amazing amazing 40s bod from the 70s you know he's um his good night good luck goodbye line oh yeah which is delivered with a 15 minute silence between good luck and goodbye yeah good night good luck
and then you know it's preceded just just slightly by a sexy raising of the eyebrows <laughs> he's he gives a very interesting performance um razzy nominated he, razzy he, winning sorry he, oh dear well fuck the razzies but he's very, he's very entertaining and uh i did like him Sure. Yeah, plus, he looked like Roger Moore and David Hasselhoff. <laughs> what more could you want? Yeah. I would like to spare, take a moment to pay tribute to Faye Dunaway's legwork in this movie. Yes, <laughs> come on now. That shot yes. when the bo- I think the bow has come over. Mm-hmm. He's ordering a, a what a whiskey from the daughter yeah. mm, from six year old Christina. <laughs> He's great. He's the other scotch, honey. <laughs> oh, scotch, not whiskey. And she's going off to make it, yeah. and then just hard cut to. Um... <laughs> <laughs> to John bringing her leg right up next to her face. <laughs> the movement of the legs is just... It's like they're independent from her body. She, it's its kind of like there's in, in, she's a Barbie doll and there's some invisible hands just kind of... I don't know, the, the, the movement of the legs just c- compelled me for hours. <laughs> yes, Christina Crawford Child, um, Mara Hobel, she did have some moments that were really affecting. Mm. The one that really got to me, it's, it's hard to say why, but I watched it again. During the bush cutting sequence, she says, go get a wheelbarrow. And she does. <laughs> she goes and gets a little wheelbarrow and just looks so helpless and kind of innocent, having retrieved this wheelbarrow and doesn't quite know what's going to happen mm. with her or it next. It just, it really got to me. And I really like that shot of her just sort of getting the wheelbarrow for Faye Dunaway to do something with. Mm. The relationship between Christina and Joan... <sighs> I mean, I was nervous a lot of the time because, mm. you know, you, you get that she's unpredictable from when she was barely keeping a breakdown in check from that, that first time you see her smile to being corrected by the reporter, barely keeping it in. And when she's deciding whether to, to let Christina keep two presents, I'm nervous because I know that this is going to go downhill and I know that it's only going to take a small inciting incident to <laughs> trigger <laughs> decades of abuse. And it was there. There was mm. definite, a very clear power dynamic there. And it was... <laughs> you know, an abuser's dynamic. It was pretty hard felt at times. Yeah, definitely. Like, as I mentioned earlier, I do genuinely think that mm. whatever the, for whatever reason, uh, I do think that young Christina gives a very entertaining and at times very real performance. Yeah, definitely agreed. If you want to experience the best of this film, try and see YouTube or try and see lip sync, so, so a drag queen like Lip Sinker doing the kind of <laughs> stage show to this film. Or Nina West is another drag queen who does a performance to this film. Wow. Where they just lip sync dialogue from this film, sometimes with incidental music, sometimes just with dramatic <laughs> acting in between. It's that's how you can really appreciate this film is through the window of high high camp and drag. So yeah, that's great, great. I, I guess my last good thing. I do like the aesthetic of the film, the production design. There is something to their 1940s home, this giant sort of mansion and the misty hues that are on the show throughout. And I mean, Crawford really, I mean, one of the ways in which she got the role was to show up at a sort of producer's table in full Crawford getup. And it really is quite a look. She really does look like Joan Crawford and, Mm. you know, has that sort of shaky smile and um, intense stare. It's a very believable reality that this film creates. Now, this might... Just be my error here, but did you say Joan Crawford or Faye Dunaway at the start of that sentence? I forget. Interchangeable. <laughs> you see? This is, this is what we're saying. <laughs> she became and if not, then I heard it that way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you're right. I am, I am an absolute idiot. Okay, one better thing. The one better thing. So I guess the one better thing, actually, would be to watch Mildred Pierce, which is Joan mm. Crawford's iconic Oscar-winning mm. movie performance, which does have shades of Mommy Dearest. I mean, it doesn't paint the character as an abuser, but it is mm. a film about a difficult relationship between a mother and daughter. It's actually a really great noir film, and Joan Crawford, whose acting talents have been somewhat um, maligned over the years, especially in comparison to Bessie mm. Davis, she gives a genuinely great performance in it. And whatever kind of problems she might have had in real life, whatever kind of monstrous abuser she may or may not have been, she was a great movie star. And mm. yeah, and it's also a good companion piece to this film. I think it would help you. It certainly give you more of an understanding of Joan Crawford and why she was revered in her day. So I would say go watch Mildred Pierce. It's a great, great film. Excellent. It holds it well. Whatever Happened to Baby Jane is another example of mm. Joan Crawford being incredible. Mm-hmm. She's she's very, very good in it. And it's you know interesting for... Actually, starring jo- Joan Crawford as the victim of abuse from her sister Betty Davis. Now, was Betty Davis wearing Christina Crawford's wig in that film? <laughs> was it the same? That explains a lot. That's it. Full circle. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Um, but anyway, I'm thinking of another profile of a prominent actor, and in this case, humorist, and the sadness slash anger slash personality issues that tend to be hidden behind the laughter. And that's the life and death of Peter Sellers, which stars Jeffrey ah. Rush, Charlize Theron, and Emily Watson, and directed mm. by famous director of Elm Street, The Dream Child, Credit <laughs> to Do, and Lost in Space, Stephen Hopkins. 
It follows the rise and fall of Peter Sellers. For one thing, it's an incredible performance from Russia Sellers. It really can't be overstated and yeah. properly encapsulates the torment of, of a clown. In it is a very unsettling relationship with his son. Um, I believe more liberty was taken here with facts, but it's details rather than the nature of the abuse depicted. The abuse itself follows a twisted logic that should have been the focus in Mommy, Mommy Dearest. Like I kept expecting things to go suddenly wrong for Christina because Joan is unreliable, manic and unpredictably vicious. But I feel it's better done and it's subtler in the life and death of Peter Sellers. Mm. There are also these amazing visual gags and references to his career thrown into what's an ostensibly real life. So as he creates and grows, the lines between fact and fiction begin to blur and the consequences on Sellers' mindset are obvious. The drama is reserved when it needs to be, which is what makes his complicated relationship with his family more distressing to watch and there are also moments that are played for laughs and it walks that line perfectly mm. ultimately it's a fantastic portrait of a troubled and brilliant artist and it gets it right where i felt Mom- mommy dearest doesn't now i for my one better thing i'm going to focus on the relationship between mother and daughter and specifically an abusive relationship which became the unexpected heart and focus of 2017's i tonya uh, greg, Gre- Gre- greg gillespie's film um ostensibly about the um 1994 attack on Nancy Carrigan. It's actually way more about this incredibly strained relationship between Margot Robbie's um, Tonya Harding and Alison Janney's, um, oh, what was the name of the mother character? Lavona Golden. And it's just a hideous relationship. Um, Alison Janney is this kind of grotesque figure who's just utterly despicable. And what's more, it's a comedy film that balances the actually genuinely horrible things that happen to Tonya as she grows up. It's the relationship between the two, uh, between Janie and Robbie. It's a really excellent film for that. And um, at times, the, the sort of despicable behavior of Janie becomes comical. There's a certain moment late on when it looks like Janie has finally reached out to Tonya and they're finally going to make a connection at her lowest moment when it transpires that it's self-interest and self-promotion again mm-hmm. that's gotten involved here. That's funny as much as it is heartbreaking because it's just really <laughs> really it's yeah. gonna be this unrelenting it's merciless it's merciless and it's just very entertaining it's a very funny film but a very provocative one as well and it does also contain these very larger than life characters so i think it's a film that managed to balance everything out quite well and be very effective for mm. it that was the one better thing the one better thing now, John, why don't you tell us about how people can find out about Beyond the Box Set? Sure. So, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, uh, Beyond the Box Set is my little podcast with my good friend Harry Chappell. Uh, each mm-hmm. week, we take a classic standalone movie and we each individually compete to pitch prequels, sequels, or spin offs, fantasy ones, of course, to kind of bring that film back to the big screen. So, we've done everything from kind of classics like Titanic and Gladiator to disasters like, um, oh God, what bad films. We've done, we've done The Room. We've done, um, <laughs> oh, we recently did a video video games mini season like films based on video games which was Ooh, rich yeah. pickings for terrible movies um, so we did a lot of done a lot of taylor kitsch movies recently that little window when <laughs> people thought taylor kitsch was going to be a thing was really fruitful for truly terrible movies what a um, time though. yeah and, and even some slightly lesser lesser known stuff like swiss army man and uh, other things oh, um, yeah, it's a great yeah. spread cool. That's a, yeah, so we really try and do do it all. The, the only rule is that it can't be part of a franchise or, or have an existing sequel, although we sometimes bend the mm. rules, such as when we allowed you guys to bring on Jingle all the way, even though <laughs> there, there was technically a straight to VHS sequel <laughs> out there somewhere. Well known sequel. Ah, <laughs> oh, but it was Christmas. Yeah, my Christmas spirit was overflowing a little bit too much. I regret it now. Um, <laughs> we've been running for about the same length of time that you guys have. We've just We just mm. celebrated our, our 100th episode earlier this year with our very first live episode. We did uh, ET, yeah. which Holy was crap. great. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so we, we release a new episode every Friday. Uh, please check us out. If you want to find out more, go to beyondtheboxset.com or just search for us. Just search for Beyond the Box Set on any good podcasting app. We're on most of them. And uh, yeah, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Beyond the Box Set or at Beyond the Box Set on Twitter and get in touch, please. Amazing. Yeah. And thanks for having me. Oh, no worries. Thanks very much. Yeah. And I hope yeah, thanks you're so much. come back for Inconceivable. I please cannot do. wait. <laughs> Excellent. Paul, how can people find out about the one good thing? Oh, they can just look for OGT Pod at Twitter, Facebook, and send us an email at gmail at OGTPod at gmail.com. Be sure to follow us in all those places because we do put the call out for the OG team there. And, uh, you know, if you've seen Mommy Dearest and you thought, oh, why didn't they ask me? It's because I don't have your phone numbers and I just can't go <laughs> around bulk messaging people whenever we do a new film, which is once a week. So you got to come to us. Uh, if only some get... platform could invent could be invented to allow us to contact all of these people at once. Help us, Zuckerberg! Until that time, 
Twitter, yeah. Facebook, and Gmail. Um, <laughs> all together, it just about makes that. Find us on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean, and Stitcher. If you haven't left us a review yet, then please do. It keeps us going. We are we are hanging by a thread. <laughs> We're on thin ice, guys. I've got my kid chained to every bed, every bed yeah. in the house. I've got a rose nice. left. I'm back to wire hangers at this stage. <laughs> Can't afford silk hangers. I don't know. I don't know. Rich people used to hang clothes. <laughs> poor people. Yeah, probably. they get poor people in to just hold the clothes for them. <laughs> Very good, mom. <laughs> <laughs> I hate my new accent. <laughs> You'll keep it and like it. <laughs> Very good, man. <laughs> We're also on the A Lot of Green Network. Uh, you can find us and other good Australian podcasts at alotofgreen.com.au. It's always going to make me laugh. and just, <laughs> just not Australian in any way. <laughs> Lots of good stuff there. Check them out. Do it. Uh, yeah. Bye. Cool. Thank you very much. And I'm Paul Salt. I'm Paul Goodman. And I'm John Lucas. And remember, the one good thing about Mommy Dearest are those few moments where everything slows down and you can just remark to yourself, Jesus Christ. Ha, ha, ha.